All right, awesome. So, and just so you know, Sandor, on the right of your screen, it, you see a private chat button there. That's our ingredients in case you wanna just have them at a glance. Um, I just put in there, there's 12 of them. That's in the our first formula that we created. Okay, that does not seem to be in my private chat. No, okay, maybe it's because you entered in after I did that. How about now? Oh, there it is, okay, yeah. Bingo, cool. I just learned something new. All right, cool. All right, well, let's go, let's get going. Um, so Sandor, our formula antioxer has 12 ingredients in it. One of those ingredients is goat kefir. And I wanted to see what you, what your thoughts are on adding that to a fermented uh, vegetable, fruit, herb, uh, formula, what your thoughts are on, on what it might be uh, doing or helping in terms of uh, the fermentation and the benefits uh, if, if uh, a dog's consuming it. I know that most people don't want a, a keeper added to their fermentation, but dogs seem to like it. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I actually, I used to feed kefir to my dog. Um, um, and my observation was that she loved it when it was mild, the same way that I loved it. But if I would try to feed her a batch of kefir that had gotten extremely sour, you know, no, I was no longer interested in drinking it. She was no longer interested in drinking it either. So, you know, it turns out that she and I had pretty similar uh, uh, tastes. Um, so, you know, ke kefir um, is extraordinarily biodiverse. There's more than 30 distinct organisms that are part of kefir grains. All of those organisms grow into the milk as they ferment it. And so, you know, dr drinking kefir for humans is a great, uh, you know, strategy for uh, building biodiversity in the gut. And, um, you know, mixing a small proportion of kefir, you know, into a larger mix, you know, carries those probiotics with it, with it um, you know, un unless it's subjected to uh, high heat. Um, so I would think that whatever, um, uh, you know, mixed food you're, you're adding uh, kefir into is going to benefit from all of those probiotics. That's great. That's great. You're right about the heat. We take a lot of care in making sure we never, nothing is ever uh, touching over 60 degrees. So, Great. Yep. yep. And so one of the things, let's see, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. You guys hear that or is that just me? I'm not hearing it. Okay, good. Normally I don't have problems, but uh, it's one of those things today. So on the... Kefir, what do you, what is so different about the microbiomes in kefir versus the microbiomes that are created from plant material and you know soil organisms? Well, I mean, I, I mean, actually, they're not um, um, completely different. Um, uh, you know, they're they're dominated by a lactic acid bacteria. Lactic acid bacteria is present on you know all plants growing out of soil on planet Earth, um, and they're also uh, you know in uh, the the bodies of all mammals um, and many other kinds of animals. So um, you know they're not altogether different. Like what's really notable about kefir is that you know it's it's an example of a scoby a symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast and kefir uh comes from uh central asia the caucasus mountains and uh it's been great of great interest to microbiologists and evolutionary biologists because of its microbial complexity because you know there's so many different organisms that are not only present in it but which have um, sort of a long-term institutionalized arrangement, uh, um, you know, whereby they share this uh, uh, skin, which they form uh, uh, in, a, in a concerted effort. So, you know, these 30-some organisms uh, live in a coordinated way, coordinate their reproduction, and also together create this polysaccharide skin uh, uh, that, that they share. 
Um, so, uh, you know, I would say that what's really distinctive about, you know, kefir as, a, you know, fermented product to eat or drink is it's, um, uh, you know, notable biodiversity. And, you know, what, what probiotics are all about is biodiversity and trying to build biodiversity in the gut. Right. Is that different from the, the SCOBY or the, they call it the mother that you'd find in, in apple cider vinegar? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, they, they are manifestations of a similar phenomenon. They are both examples of SCOBYs, symbiotic communities of bacteria and yeast. But, you know, in all of their particulars, in their, um, you know, in, a, in their appearance, in the specific group of organisms that are involved, they're very different. Um, Sandra, on an evolutionary scale, how long, um, or is this knowledge known, how long have those scobies been around? Um, I mean, we don't specifically know. I mean, certainly, certainly a couple of thousand years. Um, but it could be much longer than that. I mean, in, in you know, in relation to the, the scobies, like they, these communities evolved under human cultivation. Uh, um, and, you know, there, there's mythology about the origins of kefir grains, but, you know, there's no, um, uh, uh, you know, historical record because presumably it predates the, the you know, beginning of history. And, and, you know, the same is true of almost every fermented food and beverage. There's, you know, there's very little, um, you know, concrete knowledge about, um, you know, uh, 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 when and how specific fermentation uh, 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 processes began. There's a ton of speculation and there's a lot of mythology. The mythology around uh, kefir is that kefir grains were a gift to the people um, from uh, uh, that, that Muhammad brought from Allah. And, uh, you know, I wasn't there. I certainly don't know. But I tend to conceptualize these things in more, you know, secular terms. And, you know, I imagine that in a region where, you know, many families had goats uh, uh, producing milk for them. And the tradition was to sort of hang the milk in, you know, some sort of animal membrane over the entryway to the home and, and agitate it. Um, uh, as people went in and out of the home, that, you know, some families' milk started having a very pleasing, sour flavor, a little bit thicker, and they started found, finding these, um, um, you know, little, little grains in them and realized that the grains had something to do with the delicious qualities of the kefir that they were producing. And they started sharing them around, you know, to their neighbors and their relatives. And, um, you know, over time that became established as the regional style of fermenting milk. Um, I, I'm just, obviously there can be no fossil record of such things, but um, thinking about that, that in, and uh, taking a word from your latest book, it's almost a metaphor the begin for the beginning of multicellularity um, about 600 million years ago. I, I'm I'm suspicious. I, I would think that they've been around basically uh, since organisms were growing on this planet. That would be my guess. Well, but except that where was where where was milk collected in vessels um, um, for 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 these organisms to evolve before? You know, humans were working with uh, lactating animals for for their milk. Well, I, I guess that's that's a very good question, and the answer is I don't know. Uh, instantly, off the top of my head, I can think of a um, a killed young calf that um, didn't get eaten. But hey, well, that, but sure, yeah. sure. But then, how do those grains, if they establish in that environment, get into more milk? Like you know, it's really only. Yeah sort of humans that could take them from one collection of milk and put them in the, in the next collection of milk. Absolutely. Yes, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I do suspect that's uh, the um, origins of all of this date way back beyond human intervention. We've just taken advantage of something that was already there and fostered it and uh, made it absolutely brilliant. Uh, yeah, breath. well, sure. I mean, you know, the organisms predate us, the, 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 the organisms are, are biological phenomenon, but, you know, the kefir grains and the propagation of, of kefir grains, you know, I, I would argue is largely, a, you know, human cultural 
uh, uh, activity. So, so your latest book, um, you've been go hopping around the world talking to cultures, I gather. I certainly haven't read it. Um, so, so I'm really trying to probe into your book um, and finding out just how diverse and how wonderful this uh, fermentation business is around the world and, uh, and its value to humankind. Well, I mean, basically, you know, almost every individual and in almost every part of the world eats and drinks products of fermentation every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I meet people, you know, in my travels around North America and Europe and they hear what I do and they maybe once in a while someone will make a, an awful face. And, you know, they're they're thinking that, you know, fermented foods are, you know, the, the, the strongest flavor foods they've ever tried. The Roquefort cheese that was too much for them, um, um, you know, the kimchi that was too spicy for them or, or, or something. And then they say, oh, I don't, I don't I don't really like fermented foods. But I mean, in fact you know everybody eats fermented foods every day i mean you know coffee is fermented bread is fermented cheese is fermented condiments are fermented cured meats are fermented um uh, vinegar is fermented uh, vinegar ends up in 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 you know so many things um but it would be really hard to get through a day without eating or drinking anything fermented because you know they're just so um, uh, you know, so thoroughly integral to food traditions um, uh, all around the world. And, you know, my thinking about why fermentation is practiced universally is simply the reality that, you know, all of the plants and all of the animal products that make up our food and indeed that make up the food of, you know, any kind of animal, uh, uh, including dogs, um, um, you know, are all populated by elaborate communities of microorganisms. So, um, uh, you know, there's a certain inevitability to microbial transformation of our food. And, um, you know, as a, as a practical necessity, people everywhere developed techniques so that rather than decomposing their food into a disgusting, ugly mess that nobody would ever put into their mouths, we, you know, harness this invisible life force that's present in our food in order to change it in ways that, that benefit us and benefit the food, that make it more uh, stable for preservation, uh, make it more easily digestible, remove some toxic compound, make it more delicious. Um, 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 you know, those are, those are the kinds of um, um, practical benefits. Yeah, I mean, stability is, is, is probably the, well, other than the production of alcohol, which is the most widespread form of fermentation in the world, um, preservation is extremely important. Um, and, uh, you know, sauerkraut, kimchi, and pickles are strategies of preserving vegetables using fermentation. Um, you know, salamis are strategies for preserving meat through fermentation, cheeses or strategies for fermenting um, uh, uh, milk through fermentation. Um, so, um, um, you know, for, for this reason, the inevitability of fermentation, you know, people everywhere worked out strategies to, um, you know, harness this life power that's part of our food that, you know, nobody specifically understood until the 19th century when, uh, you know, Louis Pasteur started isolating different microorganisms and, you know, the science developed a consensus that, um, uh, uh, you know, fermentation was a life process driven by microorganisms. So, so uh, apart from um, preservation or stability, as you've called it, uh, and, and removal of uh, unwanted substances, what are the benefits, as you said, when a fermentation actually changes the chemical content of, of food. Um, can you speak yeah. to that? The sure, benefit? sure, sure. I mean, you know, first of all, because fermented foods and beverages are so varied, um, you know, not all fermentation processes have the same nutritional uh, uh, qualities. You know, um, uh, uh, sauerkraut does not have the same nutritional qualities as um, uh, bread, which doesn't have the same nutritional qualities as salami, which doesn't have the same nutritional qualities as coffee. Um, but the process of fermentation definitely um, transforms foods in some clear patterns of ways. And I would say that there are four broad ways that, um, oh, here, okay, um, uh, that, that, that fermentation uh, uh, transforms nutrients in foods. Number one, 
I'll call pre-digestion. The simple idea that, you know, as the food is fermenting, nutrients are broken down into simpler, more bioavailable forms. Um, so, for instance, um, uh, soybeans. Um, you know, the reason why the, we the Western vegetarian subcultures adopted soybeans as almost a singular uh, replacement for milk and meat um, uh, is that soybeans are the plant source food with the most concentrated protein. The problem is that our human bodies cannot extract the protein from soybeans, which have simply been cooked. Um, and, um, you know, you really never hear about people eating a big bowl of soybeans for dinner the way you might with lentils or chickpeas or lots of other kinds of beans. And the reason is that, you know, they're largely indigestible in that form. You eat a big bowl of soybeans and you'll have indigestion and gas, and you won't get the protein out of the soybeans. And, you know, the, the Asian cultures that pioneered soy agriculture thousands of years ago recognized the indigestibility of these beans, and they developed lots of different foods uh, 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 that involved fermenting the soybeans and pre-digesting the protein into amino acids, the building blocks of protein. So, um, you know, whether you ferment it into soy sauce or miso or tempeh or natto or, you know, any of the wide range of fermented foods that can be made out of soybeans, you know, in every case, no matter what the organism you're relying on or the length of time or the method that you use, the result is that the protein of the soybean gets broken down into amino acids. This is pre-digestion. Lactose in milk that so many people have a hard time digesting gets broken down under fermentation. Even the gluten in wheat and other grains can be broken down, not by yeast, but by bacteria. So this is, you know, one of the significant differences between, you know, yeasted bread risen for two or three hours and, you know, what we've come to call a sourdough involving a starter that's a broader community of organisms, including lactic acid bacteria that actually can break down the gluten. So these are all examples of, of, of pre-digestion. Then the second way the food can be transformed by fermentation is detoxification, which is really the same as pre-digestion, except instead of breaking down potentially nutritious compounds into simpler, more accessible forms, it involves breaking down potentially toxic compounds into forms that are benign for us. So like, you know, cyanide compounds in cassava grown in the soils of certain parts of the world. Um, um, you know, that have high enough levels of cyanide that they literally could kill somebody if they're not broken down in some ways. And, and, and there's a number of ways that people use to remove the, the um, cyanide compounds from the cassava. But the most widespread form is the simplest, and that is it's simply peeled, coarsely chopped, put in a container covered with water, and a spontaneous fermentation that follows breaks down those cyanide compounds into benign forms and renders the food safe to eat. Oxalic acid breaks down under fermentation um, and lots of different potentially toxic uh, compounds. Those are phthalates and lectins and those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the third way that fermentation um, uh, uh, transforms nutrients in foods is... Um, uh, through an accumulation of fermentation byproducts. And there are lots of different byproducts of fermentation, and some of them are being found to have, um, you know, really exciting, promising therapeutic benefits. So, for instance, natto, the Japanese soybean ferment that I mentioned earlier, has a compound that's gotten a lot of attention called natto kinase. And in any vitamin supplement store in North America, you'll find little capsules of, of natto kinase because, you know, a lot of people with um, heart problems and circulatory problems are taking this uh, um, um, extract, um, which 
you know, really is only formed during this particular fermentation process, but it's been found to break down what's called fibrin, which is the fibers that sometimes accumulate inside people's blood vessels that can constrict circulation. So, um, um, you know, this is a really important, you know, therapeutic application of this byproduct of a very traditional uh, uh, fermentation uh, process. Uh, you know, even sauerkraut has been found to have some beneficial byproducts, isothiocyanates, which are regarded as anti-carcinogenic. So, you know, there's a lot of unique compounds that get de that, that, that develop during fermentation, you know, some of which have, um, um, you know, wonderful benefits. Uh, the, the final way that fermentation transforms foods nutritionally is the one that I would consider the most profound one, and that is live bacterial cultures. Um, so, you know, contrary to the indoctrination that most of us received, uh, you know, about how dangerous bacteria are and how much we need to avoid them and, you know, use this array of products that are available to um, uh, kill them by any means necessary. Um, you know, it turns out that bacteria are the matrix for all life um, and are extremely important to our functionality um, and, you know, and, and of every multicellular form of life. Um, you know, evolutionary biologists have come to a broad uh, uh, consensus that all life is descended from bacteria and other single cell organisms. The corollary to this is that multicellular organisms, none of us, um, you know, no plants, no animals, uh, uh, no fungus has ever lived without single cell bacteria. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we've been reading a lot the last couple of decades about our human microbiome. So, you know, every healthy human adult is host to mind boggling numbers, you know, more than a trillion bacteria. Um, but you know, this isn't unique to us. You know, every other kind of organism has its own microbiome. I mean, in the case of our, our human microbiome, you know, it, it exists in great biodiversity, but we are slowly realizing that it exists in narrower, narrower and narrower biodiversity. And, you know, as a result, partially of chemical exposure that we all have, whether that's, you know, antibiotic drugs or chemicals in our water supply, um, you know, or other kinds of chemicals that, 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 that we are exposed to, um, um, you know, and as a result of shifts in diet, primarily the fact that we eat so much less fiber than our uh, ancestors did, um, that as a result of those, those, those factors, we have less biodiversity than people in the past did. Um, and, um, uh, you know, there's there, there there's at least like a theoretical connection between many of the emergent health problems of our time and this narrowing of biodiversity in the gut. Um, so, I mean, I think for our general health, it's you know very beneficial for people both to you know eat more fiber and eat foods that are bacteria rich. Um, and both of these things can help to support increased biodiversity in the gut and increased biodiversity in the gut can potentially improve um, uh, uh, digestive processes, uh, what we call our immune function. And there's increasing evidence that many other systems uh, uh, in our bodies, their, their, their chemistry is regulated by bacteria in the gut in ways that we don't yet understand, including our brain chemistry. So, you know, serotonin and other chemical compounds that determine how we feel and how we think um, are regulated by bacteria in the gut and can potentially be improved by enhancing biodiversity. Wow. wow. <laughs> you say that? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, you know, I would say that, um, um, you know, I, I mean, certainly I've seen plenty of, um, you know, marketing of specific fermented uh, beverages or sometimes foods, um, you know, that, 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 that makes unsubstantiated claims. And, um, you know, if, if I was diagnosed with a brain tumor, you know, just because there are anti-carcinogenic compounds in sauerkraut does not mean sauerkraut is going to, you know, cure your, your brain tumor. 
Um, um, so, you know, I think we have to be realistic about this. Um, um, and, and, and also we, ha we have to recognize that, you know, this has not been fully studied. Like there really have not been clinical trials about sort of, you know, using fermented foods and beverages as treatments for, for specific diseases. However, these foods are extremely, extremely safe. I mean, in the case of fermented vegetables, you know, they are safer than raw vegetables. Um, um, you know, and they have a lot of like generalized benefit. I mean, my feeling is that, you know, anybody, anybody can potentially benefit from incorporating these foods into their diet, but that is not, you know, a, a guarantee that, it, that, that they're going to ameliorate any particular uh, a health issue that uh, a person might be having. Um, Sandor, one question that's instantly sprung to my mind is that um, we have an enormous problem today with things like, uh, well, it's very specifically glyphosate in our food, particularly our vegetables. Um, do you think fermentation has a role in breaking that down and making it less harmful to us? Um, well, I mean, there there is a limited amount of, of evidence. There was a study I, I, I saw that was done in Germany where they found that, you know, indeed the fermentation broke down residue of, um, you know, certain uh, um, um, pesticides uh, um, in food. I don't know that it was specifically glycosate, um, you know, but, but I think that that does not really address the problem like the biggest problem with glycosate is not like the impact that it has like on our bodies when we ingest the food grown with it it's what it does to the diversity of of the bacteria or, or the the organisms in in the soil um um so so sure it could have some limited application like that but it you know, we really need to stop using chemicals like that. So, so, so it stops, um, you know, harming the biodiversity of the soils that we rely on for our food. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't argue about that. Um, when you, um, or when meat is broken down in a fermentation process, all meat is covered by, um, fibers uh, does does do the organisms break down those fibers like if you have really tough meat that's full of tough fibers do the organisms the organism attack those as well and make the meat more um i don't know less chewy and more able i've obviously mentioned being able to be more digested and break down um I mean more more tender that's the word we're looking for. Yeah, yes. sure, sure. So, uh, okay. I mean, uh, you know, I, um, you know, I, I am not a biochemist, and I, you know, I can't tell you with with meat specifically, you know, what the fermentation is 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 breaking down. But you know, there are lots of applications of fermentation where you take tough um, uh, uh, cuts of meat and ferment them, and it helps to make them more tender. Yep. Okay. I think that answers the question, really, Sandor. I mean, I'm no biochemist either. I'm just a, a vet who's made a lot of observations relating diet to disease. So, um, yeah, we often have to leave that sort of technical stuff to the experts. Another question, Fer fermenting fat. Can you just talk about that for a moment? How, how does, if you have a very fatty, something that's fatty, do, do the organisms attack that well? Well, I mean, certainly there are, um, you know, organisms that can break down fats. Um, um, and there are, you know, there are plenty of traditions of, um, of, of, of fermenting fat. Um, you know, de definitely not every organism of fermentation and perhaps not even most organisms of fermentation, but there do exist organisms of fermentation that produce enzymes that can break down lipids. Um, um, so, so, you know, yes, that, that can be a part of it. And, um, you know, certainly there's lots of fermentation as well of, um, uh, uh, you know, cream and butter and, uh, um, um, creamy cheeses. Um, um, when I was in the Faroe Islands this winter, um, I had a wonderful, uh, uh, ferment that was basically the, 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 the fat, uh, uh lining the kidneys from sheep. Um, uh, um, stuffed into 
basically pieces of the sheep's intestines and hung to spontaneously ferment. And um, it was so delicious, um, um, just like incredibly delicious. Um, so, 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 so yes, um, fats can be broken down under fermentation. Fabulous. Well, let's go because into, have, let's go right sorry. into fermenting. Uh, that's no problem. We're we'll going into fermenting uh, various meats. Cause I know you've, you've seen uh, that all over the world. Um, Dr. B and I are big, big fans of your, uh, that documentary you did, Republic of Fermentation. Um, so tell me about if if our viewers wanted to toy around with the idea of doing their own fermented meat for their dogs in their home. Uh, we know dogs bury bones and then they leave them for two weeks and they dig them up and, and eat them. Um, as Ian says, uh, stinky, all stinky, but very valuable. What, what would you say would be a simple way to you know, for somebody to ferment, say chicken legs or, you know, other byproducts, yeah. we don't really eat that much. Yeah. So let me first explain like, what is the biggest uh, limitation in preserving meat with fermentation? So, you know, you, with, with plant material, you could take, you know, any kind of vegetable, any kind of plant and, um, you know, you could you could salt it, get the salt pulls juice out of out of the plant material, get it submerged under its own juices or some added water or some other added liquid. And all plants have carbohydrates and all plants have lactic acid bacteria. So, you know, you generally don't need to add anything. Um, and, and, and really, the significance of the salt is more than anything else about pulling the juice out of the vegetables so you can get the vegetables submerged because if the vegetables are not submerged, then typically rather than the lactic acid bacteria dominating, various molds will dominate. And, um, um, you know, they, they would end up, you know, turning the loosely shredded vegetables into a puddle of slime rather than into delicious, tangy, crunchy sauerkraut. That happened uh, the first time I, I, the very first time I fermented, that was me. <laughs> Um, but so one of the limitations with fermenting meat or, or at least with preserving meat through fermentation is, um, you know, a, the meat has, um, um, you know, only negligible carbohydrate content and it's carbohydrates that are fermenting into the acids or the alcohol that enable things to be effectively preserved and B, um, you know, at least interior flesh meat does not have any specific reliable um, bacterial communities that we can count on. So, um, you know, it works best for fermenting meat if we add some source of carbohydrates as well as some source of lactic bacteria, which could really be as simple as a little bit of plant material. Um, so, um, you know, there's lots of different approaches to, to doing that. Like in, you know, in modern salami making, it's just a little bit of dextrose is added to the meat mix. And then that's the carbohydrate, which ferments rapidly and acidifies the meat for the longer dry curing. But, but, but generally that first day is at, you know, a, 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 a warm ambient temperature. Um, to get the bacterial activity going quickly to acidify it rapidly before hanging it for a longer period of time in a cooler environment for the dry aging. Um, the way a lot of um, Asian cultures have um, uh, approached this is adding rice. So I make this Thai style of uh, uh, fermented pork, nem, um, um, and I usually use ribs, but you can use other cuts and you can use ground meat as well. And what I do is I mix cooked rice with um, a bunch of raw garlic 
and a little bit of salt. And I make a paste out of those three ingredients. And then I just, I just basically coat all of the edges of the ribs that I want to ferment with this paste. And then I put them in a Ziploc bag, get as much of the air out as I can, and I leave it on the counter. And every day I massage it a little bit and move the paste around so that, you know, the paste covers any spots that might have um, um, been bare. Um, uh, so, you know, there's lots of different methods for doing that. Um, um, you know, all across Asia, there's different ways that people do that. Another way people approach this, and I, I learned about this first in Iceland, um, you know, and then, and then, you know, I read the book of another um, uh, uh, popularizer of fermentation who, you know, sort of counsels fermenting everything with, with this, but is to use whey. So whey is a byproduct of, you know, any fermentation of, of milk. You know, yogurt expresses whey. Um, uh, cheese making always produces whey. Um, um, but, you know, it, whey is a, a, you know, a byproduct that there's a lot of, um, you know, anywhere where people are making things with, with, with milk. And, um, you know, what the, the, the old tradition in Iceland is, you know, when people slaughter an animal, they take the organ meats and just put them in whey. They'll make blood sausage with the blood and age it in whey. And the whey is both acidic, so it provides a safe environment that protects the meat from developing any uh, uh, bacteria that could potentially lead to illness or food poisoning. And it's very convenient for us that, you know, salmonella, E. coli, uh, even botulism, but, you know, really all the organisms that we associate with food poisoning cannot tolerate an acidic environment. So once you acidify the environment a certain amount, then, you know, none of those potentially threatening organisms can grow. And so it, it, it assures safety. And then it also uh, uh, provides some carbohydrates uh, um, um, so that there can be continued fermentation and continued acidity. Um, and so, you know, it, 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 it preserves the meat uh, um, um, effectively, um, you know, and it provides a, a real critical mass of, of, of lactic acid bacteria that can get into the meat and, you know, find the small amount of carbohydrate that's in the meat and uh, uh, break them down. Wow, that's very interesting. I'm so hungry now with those, for those ribs. <laughs> is, is that a recipe that you share in your new book, uh, Fermentation Journeys? Um, no, but I, I write about it a little bit in each of my other books, in, uh, in, in Wild Fermentation and in The Art of Fermentation. I, 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 I write a, a, about this a little bit. And, um, uh, and, and I, I mean, the book that I, the, 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 the other popularizer of fermentation that I was referring to is someone named Sally Fallon, and she wrote a book called Nourishing Traditions, which has um, uh, had, had a huge influence. Um, and she even uses it for, as a starter for sauerkraut. You know, I, like I don't really want my sauerkraut tasting like milk or whey. Um, uh, you know, at this point, I've fielded so many hundreds of questions from people who were confused by that and thought that they needed whey in order to make sauerkraut or they went to the bodybuilding store and put bodybuilding powder, you know, into their cabbages. So, you know, you don't need whey to make sauerkraut. But if you're trying to ferment you know, um, um, you know, something like like meat or organ meats. I mean, it's a really wonderful medium for, you know, fermenting so many different kinds of things. And then, of course, you know, you don't need whey if you're already using goat milk or, you know, some other form of milk. I mean, you, you really could do the same thing with any kind of, you know, fermented milk product, whether it's kefir or, or yogurt. And, you know, the acidity and the um, uh, critical mass of bacteria uh, uh, that, that'll be in that fermented milk will really provide, uh, um, uh, you know, whatever it is you want to ferment with the same things that that whey will. So, you know, you could use whey, which is uh, uh, generally available as a byproduct, or, you know, you can use um, uh, a kefir, yogurt, or, or other kinds of fermented milk. Sandor, um, to what extent do the natural enzymes in raw foods contribute to the fermentation process? Well, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, sure. I mean, most 
you know, biological creations contain the enzymes to digest themselves. And, right. you know, any, any, any time a food is aged, you know, there's going to be some activity from the enzymes that are indigenous to whatever, you know, that, that, that food is, um, you know, on the other hand, generally, you know, generally, if we just left, you know, a, a, a food product to, you know, for the enzymes within it to break it down, we generally wouldn't call that fermentation, we would call that decomposition. Um, um, and, you know, generally fermentation will be driven by the action and the enzymes of, you know, organisms yep. that are either, you know, indigenous to the food or that we um, introduce. Okay, so my follow-up question, which has possibly partially been answered, but if we were to take vegetables and put them through a juicer, for example, and you've mentioned salt as pulling the fluid out of the um, vegetables or whatever you're fermenting, how is fermentation, under, say, of a vegetable or a meat, I guess, um, is it enhanced by putting it through a juicer so you completely break the cells apart to release the contents, or, or is it immaterial? Well, I mean, you definitely can ferment. You, you can ferment, you know, carrot juice or, or apple juice. So, okay, let's take apple juice because that's, you know, there, there is, a, you know, an established ferment that, you know, people in apple growing regions all around the world, um, 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 you know, make from the juice of apples. And that is hard cider. And, um, you know, and I don't think that, I, I mean, I do not think it is the juicing of the apple that, 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 that drives the ferment. I mean, the same thing, you know, would happen to slices of apple that, 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 that you left. Um, you know, the, the, the yeast that's here, I'm just trying to get out of the sun there. Okay. That's better. The, the, the yeast that's there is on the skins of the apples. So in the juicing of the apples, all of the juice, you know, runs against the skins and picks up yeast. So uh, I'm thinking, Sandor, we've also got fiber in there, not just the juice. Do the bacteria attack that fiber and break it down? If, if we've just totally yeah, broken sure. Sure. I mean, you know, something does because, you know, I'm, I'm you know, fruits tend to decompose. Um, uh, you know, the, the simplest that I ferment that I know how to make is not with apples, but with bananas. And if you just take an overripe banana or a few overripe bananas and you mash them up, um, you know, they will, over the course of um, um, a limited number of days, they will liquefy um, and they will begin to ferment into alcohol and then they will for spontaneously begin to ferment into vinegar. Um, so, um, so yes, I mean, the, you know, the, the, something is breaking the fibers down and I can't say whether it is sort of the yeast, probably not the yeast. It's probably enzymes that are, you know, part of the banana from the beginning. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether by doing this process of breaking food apart, you're actually speeding up the fermentation process. Yeah, um, uh, I mean, yes, I think you're, you're probably speeding it up, but probably it would happen, you know, it would happen eventually on its own anyway. Yeah, and what's sure. the rush? <laughs> <laughs> we want to eat it. That's yes, that's right. That's that's what I was thinking. You were that's what I was thinking. Sander was thinking. It's gonna do it anyway. What's the rush? <laughs> yes. Okay. But uh no, this is very interesting. So you know, I know that there's not a lot of um I'm sure documentation on this, but does does fermentation break everything down? If you think about things like uh chlorella is a amazing supplement. But in order for us to get the benefits from it, it has to be broken down. There's water processes, there's chemical, there's there's mechanical processes that break that cell wall. So do we do you know if 
something like a chlorella, for example, if we look at that, just one example, if that gets broken down and we, instead of having to mechanically or, or chemically or in another way, uh, break that wall, does fermentation do that? I mean, I can't speak specifically to chlorella at all. I know nothing about it, but you know, the, 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 the fact that the earth is not littered with, um, um, you know, sort of dead organisms suggests that like, you know, everything gets broken down. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not arguing that it is exclusively fermentation breaking everything down. I mean, it's, you know, that's the biodiversity of the soil. That's all of the, you know, sort of, you know, small animals and nematodes and uh, fungi, you know, and bacteria. Um, so, I, I mean, certainly, um, um, you know, life processes break everything down in every single case. Um, um, but you know, wh whether we could say that it's fermentation breaking everything down, I actually think that it's, you know, sort of a, a, a greater, uh, variety of life processes that are breaking everything down. Now, maybe if these other life processes weren't present, maybe given enough time, um, um, uh, you know, microorganisms would, would, would do it all. But the fact is that other small organisms get to things faster. Sandra, listening to what you're saying, I'm gathering that it must be, from what I can see, and, and it would be oxygen, molds, and alkalinity that are the enemies of fermentation. Would that be a true thing to say? Well, I mean... I wouldn't say that molds, well, I wouldn't say that any of those things are the enemies of fermentation. Okay. Because, um, um, you know, there are fermentation, there are lots of fermentations that in, that are that involve uh, uh, fungi. I mean, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the foods and beverages that are fermented, um, um, you know, involve fungi as well as bacteria. Um, um, so I, I wouldn't say that molds are the enemy. I mean, look, in the world of cheese, um, um, you know, some of my favorite cheeses would not be possible were it not for sort of collaborations between uh, bacteria and, and molds. Um, so I don't think molds are the enemy of fermentation. Um, uh, I mean, I did use the example of fermenting vegetables that if you don't get the vegetables submerged, rather than lactic acid bacteria dominating, molds will dominate. But there are also lots of cases where the molds and, and the and the bacteria work together. Um, uh, alkalinity. I mean, there there are um, you know certain ferments that produce alkaline byproducts. So I, I mentioned Japanese natto earlier. Well, the, the fermentation byproducts in natto are alkaline. Um, wow. and, and, and growing this bacteria on food makes it more alkaline. And then the, the alkaline has similar protective um, um, uh, qualities to acidity in food. You know, it limits the range of, 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 of what can grow. So, you know, in certain cases, alkalinity is what we're after. In fermentation. Again, we could, you know, I reference natto, but we could also reference cheeses like, you know, the soft runny cheeses, you know, brie and camembert type cheeses are, you know, the, as they get riper and to my palate more delicious, they become, you know, more, more alkaline. And then what was the third thing that you said? Uh, Oh, I just said oxygen, molds, and oxygen. So, yeah, sure. So, I mean, now to, uh, to a biologist, you know, fermentation implies anaerobic, uh, you know, biologists would define fermentation as anaerobic metabolism, the production of energy without oxygen. And, and certainly the, you know, the, the fermentation of vegetables into sauerkraut or kimchi or pickles is anaerobic. It doesn't require oxygen. The fermentation of milk into yogurt or kefir is anaerobic, doesn't require oxygen. But, you know, if you want to ferment vinegar, you need oxygen. Like, you know, the, the, the reason why alcoholic beverages are always sealed so tightly is to protect them from oxygen because in the presence of oxygen, there are organisms everywhere that will um, consume the alcohol and transform it into acetic acid, which, which is vinegar. Um, you know, all of the molds that people cultivate. 
you know, whether it's the cheeses that I've just mentioned, or whether we're talking about tempeh, the Indonesian style of fermenting soybeans, or talking about koji, which is basically rice or barley or soybeans with a fungus aspergillus oryzae grown on it. Um, um, but, you know, this is very important. And I mean, you know, sake and all the alcohol from rice that, that, that people across Asia uh, enjoy, soy sauce, miso, um, and a range of other foods are made with koji, which is this specific fungus, so which requires oxygen. So, um, sure, I mean, in, in, in broad generality, we could say that, you know, oxidation, you know, drives a lot of food spoilage, but there are also uh, uh, certain fermentation processes that require oxygen and, and, and need an environment where oxygen will be, will be present. That's awesome. So, so really, um, Sandor, people shouldn't just think, oh, I'll go and ferment stuff without very specific knowledge. Well, I mean, what I would say is people shouldn't be intimidated by fermentation. But, but the practice of fermentation is really about manipulating environmental conditions so as to encourage the growth of certain organisms while simultaneously discouraging the growth of other organisms. And um, you definitely don't need to be a rocket scientist to ferment. You don't need a laboratory. You don't need a microscope. You don't need a knowledge of microbiology. But what you do need is a rough sense of what are the conditions you're trying to create. And, you know, when you're when you're making sauerkraut, that's simply getting the vegetables submerged under their own juices. Um, but but understanding that is key. Without that understanding, you're you're likely to end up with 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 a moldy mess. If you want to make yogurt, then, you know, you need to sort of maintain an elevated temperature. You have to ferment it, uh, um, you know, between about 110 and 115 degrees Fahrenheit, certainly higher than body temperature. Um, and so just like figuring out how to rig up uh, an environment to maintain that temperature is, is the trick. But each fermentation process has some sort of manipulation of environmental conditions that, that's involved. And the important thing is to just understand what is the environment you're trying to create. So the key is don't be afraid of it, but do understand the environmental conditions you're creating yeah. and okay. don't assume don't assume that because you understand how to make one ferment that another ferment is going to directly extrapolate you know the, those those methods you know di different fermentation processes developed in different places you know have different methodologies and and you know and often different kinds of environments that they're trying to create and, and i would guess usually hard won by experience yeah, sure. And, 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 you know, and this is the issue with, with fermenting meat, like with fermenting vegetables, there's not that much that can go wrong. And most of the things that can go wrong will be abundantly evident to you. Um, you know, fermenting meat, the stakes are a little bit higher because, you know, there's more, there's more potential danger, but that's one of the things that's so appealing about, you know, using something like whey or some other sort of living acidic medium because that's going to be immediately protective and, and sort of, you know, prevent any um, uh, dangerous outcomes. Brilliant. I want to do, we almost are running out of time, but I wanted to get to three more sections. So some stories right. of health and uh, probiotics versus fermented. And then the last one is something you touched upon which is organic versus traditional farming and, and just getting into a little bit about the, so yeah. the soil health and organic farms versus others and what that might mean to the okay. quality of the base so ingredients. Give me each, so each, each, each one me, individual. Yeah. yeah let me, I'll, I'll ask the questions. I'll just wanted to give you a quick summary. So right. let's talk about, let's talk about organic versus traditionally farmed and raised. Uh, Can we just change it? So there's nothing traditional about chemical agriculture. It's, you know, it's about, it's a little more result. So let, 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 so let, let, let's talk about like, you know, conventional chemical agriculture versus traditional agriculture where there were no chemicals to add and people were relying on, uh, upon, you know, compost and similar strategies for maintaining soil fertility. Love it. 
Love it. So yeah, so you know, in no-till regenerative farming is is coming back, and yet it's you know the old traditional ways that worked. Whereas after what 47, 49, the chemical methods, the high tilling, that's that became a thing, and it's forevermore been our been what we've been doing to our soil. So w- w- when we talk about raw ingredients, whether they're you know conventional produce, that is to say, not organic or regenerative, versus organic and regenerative, what what is the difference to you, uh, and and what is the difference to the end result of a fermented product? Okay, well, I mean, I will just say that personally, I'm thinking less about its impact on me, and I'm thinking more about its impact on the earth. And, um, you know, that the, the, the chemical methods are destroying soils, destroying waterways, creating pollution, diminishing biodiversity. Um, you know, there, there, there are, you know, problems down the road for, for, for us eating it. But, uh, you know, personally, I think that those pale in terms of, you know, in contrast to the problems, you know, happening in the soil and, 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 and on the earth with, with biodiversity. But, um, you know, sure, we're, we're getting all of this chemical exposure, some of the theories about sort of our diminished biodiversity in our gut has to do with, um, um, uh, you know, agricultural chemicals that, 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 that we are uh, ingesting. So, um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I think that it, it, it's much healthier for us, much healthier for our pets, much healthier for the earth if, um, you know, we are supporting forms of agriculture that are relying on traditional methods for soil fertility rather than um, using chemical means. What I'm wondering is if you've got chemicals that are designed to, uh, you know, pesticides, herbicides, if, if they're designed to, in fact, kill organisms, does that ingredient mean that you have less to work with in the fermentation process than, say, mm. a, an, an organic uh, or, or regenerative farmed set of vegetables that are fermented? Do you have any knowledge of that? Well, I mean, sure. I, I mean, I have experience with it. And, I, you know, what I can say, because I've taught about a thousand workshops where people just handed me a bag of vegetables to ferment, is that, I mean, you, you know, vegetables grown with chemicals seem to ferment just fine anyway, and they acidify just fine anyway. You know, whether, you know, they are nutritionally different or not. Like, I couldn't really speak to that. I mean, I certainly have, like, met people, read about studies where they found, you know, greater nutrient density in um, uh, uh, vegetables grown, you know, using organic methods. But but I can't really speak speak to that. I mean, I can just say that, you know, vegetables grown with pesticides seem to ferment just fine. Fair enough. Fair enough. Tell, tell us about some of the health benefits that you've seen from, you know, all of your travels around the world, speaking to people at your book signings and, and, you know, whether it's your website, emails, just all the, the, the I mean, more than anything, I have, I I have had thousands of people tell me that um, introducing these foods into their diet led them to better digestion. Like, I think that that is the, the first and most dramatic thing that most people can observe about their own health um, um, is, you know, the ways that these foods improve digestion. That's the thing I hear about most often. Um, you know, I mean, certainly I've, I've, I've heard anecdotal reports, but, you know, if one person tells me that like eating sauerkraut cured their cancer, I, I take that with a grain of salt because I don't really think that, you know, an individual person's idea of what made them better is necessarily accurate. So yes, I have heard stories like that, but, you know, also I am reluctant to sort of, you know, recommend sauerkraut as an effective treatment for, for, for that. Sure. Um, immune function. I think that's a much harder thing for individual people to observe about themselves and attribute to a singular thing. But I think that, you know, most of the, um, um, uh, um, 
clinical trials that have been done not with traditional fermented foods, but with probiotic capsules, um, you know, that's the thing that they're demonstrating over and over again, is that, you know, the, the group taking probiotics, you know, exhibits signs of improved immune function as compared to the group, uh, uh, the, the control group. And, you know, I have anecdotally observed that in my own life, um, um, that, that, you know, incorporating these foods in, into my, my daily diet, you know, has some effect of improving overall immune function. Um, um, and, uh, um, you know, I think that anything a probiotic supplement can do, um, you know, foods, you know, traditionally fermented foods can do better. Um, you know, mostly because, you know, probiotic therapy is all about biodiversity and most capsules, you know, they might have a billion cells, but it's going to be a billion replicas of a single cell or maybe two or three. Whereas any kind of traditional food is just always going to have biodiversity. So, you know, the sauerkraut is dominated by lactic acid bacteria, but it's still a broad community. And the fermentation is actually a successional process where you get different strains of bacteria um, um, uh, becoming dominant, you know, over the course of it as conditions shift. And so, you know, just every fermented food has is, is an embodiment of, of biodiversity. Wow. It's amazing. And so you just touched upon probiotics. What, what can you tell us about probiotics versus fermentation? That it, is there any difference? I mean, you, you, you alluded to the, the smaller spectrum, I guess would be the word, um, in, in, um, in healthy bacteria. No. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I would, I would consider live fermented foods, meaning fermented foods that are not cooked or heat processed after their fermentation are all probiotic. That said, uh, you know, I will acknowledge that pro probiotic is really a contested term. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people in the probiotic supplement industry who would dispute the idea that, you know, any fermented food that has not undergone um, um, uh, clinical trials could be regarded as, 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 as probiotic, um, you know, but, you know, probiotics have everything to do with biodiversity and traditionally fermented foods are much more biodiverse than, than, um, um, your typical probiotic capsule. You know, we have a problem with our, with our system because, you know, nobody's, nobody's making clinical trials of traditional fermented foods because nobody owns them. You know, people are only, you know, creating clinical trials of probiotic capsules that are proprietary, that somebody owns. And, you know, that's the only incentive that someone has to invest all the money that it takes to create a controlled clinical trial. And, you know, nobody owns sauerkraut. Nobody owns kefir. So nobody has an incentive to put that kind of money into constructing clinical trials because the benefit won't accrue to any single manufacturer. It would just demonstrate that like this food, which is in the public domain, um, um, you know, would have these specific benefits. Um, so, you know, I would regard, um, um, you know, all fermented foods or beverages that have not been uh, uh, heat processed I would regard them all as probiotic, but, you know, I'm acknowledging that there are people who would disagree with that characterization. That's a fair point. I mean, uh, it, it's well, very I'm much the same. Glad, I'm so glad that, Sandor, you've made that point. I'm really pleased to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's uh, very much like everything. It's, uh, you know, if it's not proprietary, why would we spend the money when it'll benefit our competitors um, and, you know, hopefully we'll make some headway in that space in, in doing the right studies, but they can be expensive for people who don't know. They can be anywhere from 50,000 on the very low end of many hundreds of thousands of dollars and many years. So you're putting out that money and you won't be seeing any benefits, even if you know, or hope to know what those benefits will be as a company, you're looking at, you know, two, three years down the road and a, a couple hundred thousand dollars. So, uh, that's. That's interesting. So this is thousands of years old fermentation. How, where do, how do you quantify where, 
how would you quantify where you think we're at in human fermentation understanding? Are we 10%, 5%? Uh, it feels like we went through this golden age, like in the last two years where people were fermenting sourdough and making their own beer and, and wine. And, but I, I feel like it's, it's, it's uh, jumped, but I, don't, I still feel like it's pretty young. Am I right? Young, young in its understanding. Well, sure. I mean, you know, the you know, science only began to understand, you know, how fermentation happens about 150 years ago. And, um, you know, it's really only since, you know, around the dawn of the new millennia that millennium that, um, you know, science began to have tools to look at and try to understand broad communities of microorganisms, you know, until, you know, until the end of the of the last century. Um, you know, what we, what the knowledge we had, um, um, accumulated about bacteria had to do with cultivating single organisms in a controlled environment. And, you know, that is very different from the way microorganisms exist in the world. You know, microorganisms are everywhere, but they are never singular. You never have just one kind of bacteria. They exist in these broad communities and they're, you know, sharing metabolic byproducts. They're sharing genetic material. They're collaborating. Um, um, so, um, uh, um, I mean, I think that there's, there, there's a lot still to be learned, even though, you know, we have a very clear general understanding of, you know, what is fermentation? How does it work? You know, we're learning more and more about, you know, how varied it can be, um, um, uh, you know, wh whether, you know, something like a sourdough is stable over time or whether it is evolving over time. I mean, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of aspects uh, uh, of fermentation. And of course, the interaction between the food we ingest and the bacteria uh, uh, already existing in our in our intestines. So I mean, there's there's there, there, there's much still to learn. Um, um, you know, in terms of like the interest in fermentation, um, um, you know, it was sure. I mean, since the pandemic and a lot of people, you know, having time at their on their hands, stuck at home, a lot of people have become interested in it. But you know, at the time that um, uh, my book, The Art of Fermentation came out, which was 2012, like from about a year or two before then until the present, every year I've seen people's lists of like the top food trends, you know, new, new food trends of 2011, fermentation. And that just always makes me laugh because, you know, the, the products of fermentation have enjoyed enduring popularity. You know, bread, cheese, sauerkraut, pickles, olives, chocolate, coffee, uh, cured meats. I mean, you know, these foods have really been as popular in our grandparents and great grandparents times as they are now. What's new is that people are thinking about fermentation. People are interested in fermentation. People are interested in bacteria. And I think that's what's driving the increased interest in fermentation basically since the release of the human microbiome project which was you know right at the end of the of of, of the last uh, century so i think that interest in fermentation is just going to be getting um, um greater and greater um and i also i think that scientific investigation of uh, the processes of fermentation is also going to be uh, increasing Great. Great. I just have I, one last question and I'll let, let Ian have the last question if you have any remaining in. Here's my question. Uh, do you take any probiotics or fermented vegetables, fermented, um, do you take any probiotics or do you take any fermented vitamins um, that are created? No, no. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I eat food that I consider to be probiotic all the time. Um, you, you know, I, I eat sauerkraut and kimchi and yogurt and kefir. And um, here I've just been sipping on a, a, a beetroot kvass. Um, um, you know, there's there, 
there's a lot of diversity. Like you don't have to just have one fermented food you eat all the time. But but um, you know, I find that it's it's um, I mean, not only tasty and delicious and fun, but um, you know, supportive of my continued good health to um, you know incorporate a range of different fermented foods and beverages uh, uh, into my diet in an ongoing way. I love it. Ian, you're on. Thank you. I've just got one little comment to make. Um, we have charities or we have philanthropists that um, donate money to individual charities to help specific causes. But we need philanthropists, I believe, and I've thought of this for a long time, that would donate money to do research that benefits the planet, not just individual organisations. And the sort of research you spoke about, looking at how valuable... Uh, various fermented foods, for example, would be to human health would be absolutely brilliant because it would then become applicable on a wide scale and help the whole human race and the earth itself. So that would be brilliant. So we need philanthropists to think outside the square. Great. Well, I mean, I love that. And I mean, you know, certainly we're seeing a little bit of, 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 of that, you know, for instance, the research a couple of years ago that, that, that suggested that, you know, eating sauerkraut every day might improve mental health and, and uh, uh, treat depression. You know, I think that, that those were preliminary findings based on a, on a rather small study, but, but, you know, they're, 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 you know, there, there have been some studies outside of the proprietary probiotics industry, but I wholeheartedly agree that we need more of that. And that would be a really worthwhile investment for, um, you know, some uh, um, wealthy individual or philanthropy. Absolutely. Sandra, where, can we, uh, where do you want us to buy your book? Um, well, I want to I want to um, uh, uh, shout out my website. So I have a I have a website wildfermentation.com and you can find out about the workshops that I teach uh, and about my books there. And, um, you know, buy my books where wherever you like to buy books. They're 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 widely available. You can order them via my website. But, um, you know, if you have a, a favorite bookstore that you like to go to, um, ask them to get it for you. That that would be great. Love it. Thank you so much. Sandra. This, has been, this has been really enlightening. Okay. Well, wonderful to talk to both of you. My thanks Same. very profoundly. Thank you. Okay. Pleasure to meet you. Good to meet you both. And just, uh, you can Thank click you. a lead studio at the bottom with the red X. Okay. I see it. And thanks. You will stay on. Bye Sandor. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. That was cool. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, we got to edit that. Um, do you have any comments that you want me to have for this this uh, this edit? Kind of no, like I'm post just... deep debrief, you know? Anything you found interesting? Oh, the whole thing. Um, it was an education. Um, yeah. I'm just a bit more immersed in it, um, more understanding of it, fermentation, I mean. No, it was I've got to go away and process it now. Yeah, right. That's that's the way I feel. Mm. I think what we'll do is is piggyback on another podcast or sorry, stream that we have where we record it and then I'll just cut that piece. You and I can debrief on some thoughts. Um I can let you rewatch this and if you want, and then you know, but it'd be good we'll cut in some comments on, uh, you know, in this segment, we, uh, Sandor talks about X and, you know, what did you think of that, Ian? And you can, you yeah. can make some comments. That might be a cool way to do that. I think it would be very good because you occasionally wanted to jump in, but you also wanted to hear what he had to say. I know it was, it, you know, it was, it was cool that we recorded it, but it was, yeah, it was like, you know, they say here, uh, drinking from a fire hose, yes. you know? Right. And, you know, it was just like, you know, oh, oh. And so I was deleting notes and I was taking notes like, oh, I'll ask him about this. <clears throat> but he's got such a a great command of the topic. I mean, it's so yeah. impressive. That's right. Yeah. All right. Cool. So um, I'll do that. I'll I'll, I'll uh, in fact, I think what I'll do is I'll I'll have it cut up.
and then we can go through, we'll make this really easy. So next time we can just go, we can just look at it and, and make a comment. We'll put that at the beginning of the, of each cut. And, uh, that will be its own little mini video. Okay. Sounds good. I have cool. to go. I've, I've got a grandparents day. I've got good. On a... <laughs> good. That sounds, that sounds like, what is it, like a school thing or? Yeah, school thing. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Are you going to talk about your career? Sorry? Are you going to talk about your career or just being a grandparent? No, 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 no. no. I'm just, just in the audience being. Uh -huh. I'll let, I'll let you go. Enjoy your day. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Bye.